means to achieving creativity and success. She recalls the early days of her career when dreams were all she had. I basically just sort of did my own music. And then I met Lindsay. And I sang one song with him in 1966, the end. And then I never saw him or heard from him again for two years. And he called and asked me to join his rock and roll band. Just out of the blue. He had an amp export track. And we uh, kind of rented a room in his dad's coffee plant up by the Cow Palace. And we spent a year in this room that was about as big as the couch, that, about that big, uh, recording a lot of the songs that are on the Buckingham Nicks album, plus one that's on that's going to be on this coming up Fleetwood Mac album. Um, and then we moved to L.A. with those tapes. Yeah, and it was it was hard, you know, when you're that when you practice that hard and you sound that good, and everybody tells you that you're not commercial and you should do something else. It's like you, you just want to say, well, obviously, we are not from the same planet. Every single time we end a year tour, people think we're breaking up. Um, every single time we end a year tour, we cry on stage and get hysterical. Because as we walk up to that stage, we know that we're not going to walk on it for a long time. Because we cannot tour again until we do another studio album. Of course, Fleetwood Mac isn't uh, breaking up. We just signed a seven-year contract for another 350 albums. 350 albums. I think my dad goes, "Are you writing? Are you have you started writing your fifth album yet?" You should be. But the fact is, is that it never breaks up. I mean, and it's had reason, much more reason in the past. I mean, if we can live through Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks breaking up, and believe me, that was a love affair of a century, that was not easy to break up on the road on the road with other, you know, with other women, you know, and he, I mean, oh, I can't tell you. It was, I would go to sleep with cotton in my ears because they'd always stick me right across the hall from him, you know, so I wouldn't hear him come in. I mean, it, really bad. And Chris and John, I mean, you know, John raging through the hallway, screaming Christine's name. Uh, you, you have no idea. As for her love life now, I don't have a lot of time to devote to a man. Um, but when I like a man, I devote every hour or minute that I can possibly squeeze out of the day to him. And it's fine, and it works, as long as I can do it and still, still, you know, do my work for Fleetwood Mac, because they are a full-time job, needless to say. And um, they, nobody in the band cares about anybody's girlfriends or boyfriends. I'll never feel like I call my own shots because they're, because I, I've always been, you know, either I was with Lindsay, it was Bucking and Nicks, or I've been with Fleetwood Mac, just Fleetwood Mac, um, by myself is, is scarier. And I don't really like calling the shots alone. I'd rather have some other people to call shots with me so that, you know, if in case you call the wrong shot, that it's not just you that is the big failure, you know? That's the scary thing about being alone. It can't be all down to me. I don't know enough to call all the shots in my life. I just don't. And also, you know, the great amount of my time is spent at the piano or, or with my tapes or at my typewriter. And every minute that I go away and try to learn how to call shots is one minute less that I get to stay at my piano. And Stevie Nicks says she'd rather be true to herself on that score than on anything else. I try very hard not to become jaded because it's like I said to my, my father when he said, Stevie, you're going to have to start realizing that you're going to have to take a little better care of your financial affairs and, and just watch a little ca more careful because you're 32 years old now. You're not a baby anymore. And you're not a little girl anymore. You're grown up. And I said, Dad... Do you, do you want me to give up that childishness so that I can watch out a little more careful? Because in giving up that, I will give up Rhiannon and I will give up dreams and I will start writing harder songs, colder songs. Because I will be 
more aware of the world that I don't want to know about or write about. And is that worth it? Is that, is that worth it? And he couldn't look at me and say, yes, it was worth it. I would rather just buy a house up in the Colorado mountains or something and just write songs and send them down the mountain and let somebody else do them. If, if, it, if it gets to turning me into a jaded, old, hardcore rock and roll star. That's not what I want to be. I can't be that. That would be letting my soul down completely. Stevie Nicks and Mary Lyon on The Source Report. Magazine cover story featuring music and conversation with Stevie Nicks, lead vocalist for Fleetwood Mac. Uh, Stevie stopped by last week. We must have talked for over 30 minutes. And if there's any one thing that I could say about Stevie after the conversation, I could say she's a sensitive and intelligent woman who, uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt, has had her difficulties making it in the entertainment business. Some stars you'll notice uh, disguise it well. Or maybe you won't. But Stevie's growing pains began exhibiting themselves during her stage performances. Well, my worst show was probably in this town in at Madison Square Garden a couple years ago. And that was just because I was so nervous. And I'd flown my family in and my voice wasn't in real good shape. And it just was, you know, one of those shows that nobody ever forgot because I was terrible. And uh I knew it, and there was nothing I could do to change it. And I just sort of died a thousand deaths. And then I had to read about it for three years. I don't resent it. It just hurts my feelings so terribly that I'd never get over it. I carry it around with me forever. Now, at age 33, a little older and perhaps a little wiser, she came up with a way to cope. I just figured out about two years ago that, that just going into a room and being quiet was the best meditation or any uh, anything for me was to just not have to talk to anybody for a little while because it really it takes a lot you know to walk out there and go you know people running around loose in the world when you just walked on the stage stevie was visiting to promote her brand new album belladonna and i asked her now that all the bumps in the road are behind her was it all worth it well, i had to go through a lot of unpleasant times to get there but now because i hung in there I got to do this album, and that, that pays me back. When I first mentioned to you that I would be talking to Stevie Nicks, uh, your cards and phone calls started arriving and asking, find out, is she really a witch just like on the album covers? Well, uh, that whole story started with the song Rhiannon, and I uh, hear Stevie explains best. I didn't intend to create any mystique about her. Rhiannon created her own mystique. I just, I, I read the name in a book that I read, and I really loved the name, and I wrote the song, and then a couple years later, I read all the books of Rhiannon and found out that she really was this sort of person who made birds and they came alive and she was a goddess of steeds. She could flip right into being a horse if she wanted to and, and uh, she really was not from this world and the song is very much about somebody that's not from this world except that it's really a the song really seems to be about a, a woman that's very involved with birds. Something told me that, that Rhiannon had something special to give. Rhiannon really did her own Thing. I just kind of put it down on paper and then she took off herself. 66 WNBC. Well, sounds like Stevie Nicks got her thing together. She was our cover story for this afternoon on the Music Magazine. I'm Michael Sarzinski. This BBC special it says the career has spanned everything from waitressing to being a member of Fleetwood Mac to creating the critically acclaimed solo album Belladonna was interviewed for the Rock Hour by London correspondent Sylvie Simmons. Sylvie asked her how she'd do a show. Just do it like a dream. Just, you know, start out with the beginning of Belladonna real acoustically. Maybe I might even start out with the beginning of Rhiannon acoustically, which would be real incredible, too. It would be depending on whether I want to start it out with Rhiannon or Belladonna. Um, and just do it like a stage production as opposed to a rock and roll show. So that's what we've done. And now, Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks has always relied on the power of dreams as a means to achieving creativity and success. She recalls the early days of her career when dreams were all she had. I basically just sort of did my own music. And then I met Lindsay. And I sang one song with him in 1966, the end. And then I never saw him or heard from him again for two years. And he called and asked me to join his rock and roll band. Just out of the blue. He had an amp export track. And we uh, 
kind of rented a room in his dad's coffee plant up by the cow palace and we spent a year in this room that was about as big as the couch that about that big uh recording a lot of the songs that are on the buckingham nicks album plus one that's on that's going to be on this coming up fleetwood mac album um and then we moved to l.a with those tapes yeah and it was it was hard you know when you're that when you practice that hard and you sound that good and everybody tells you that you're not commercial and you should do something else it's like you, you just want to say well obviously we are not from the same planet song Crying in the Night by Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham from the Buckingham Nicks album. Although Buckingham Nicks was not a commercial success, it did lead Stevie to Fleetwood Mac. If it wasn't for that, there's no way Lindsay and I could ever have walked into Fleetwood Mac as completely green as we did. And in, within two months, three months, be on the road in the guise of a rock and roll band that was famous. <laughs> Lindsay and I are going, what, what are we doing here? With Fleetwood Mac, her dreams of success came true almost overnight. Stevie's real dream, however, was to feel accepted as a part of the group. Well, at first, I didn't really think they needed another girl singer. They already had one. Um, so I went through some moments of thinking that I was simply being hired because they couldn't get Lindsay without me. I know for a fact that that's uh, how they felt, because why shouldn't they? They already had a, they had a girl singer. Mm -hmm. They needed a guitar player. They did not need another girl singer. Mm -hmm. Especially one that didn't really play piano or guitar or, you know, anything. Um, kind of like, oh, right. You, you, you'll stand out there and be the star. <laughs> and we'll just play, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, I mean, it's human nature. I mean, there was no possible way, excuse me, that I was going to believe that, uh, what they were looking for was a second girl singer. I was willing to, you know, to, to realize that logically I was lucky to get asked to join the band at all and that if I wanted to be in Fleetwood Mac, I was going to have to really figure out a gimmick. <laughs> and they knew it. They, they got it. They understood that I felt this way. And so they were real careful. And they never made me feel unwanted, and they never made me feel like excess baggage. And Christine very willingly gave me the stage, which I thought was very cool of a woman to say, oh, she's five years younger than me, and I've worked for 10 years on the road, killed myself, and here she is, Rhiannon. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, was, it was incredibly, incredibly uh, big of Christine. Chris will tell me now that there were times in the last, you know, six, seven years where she was a little jealous. And I, I swear, as God is my witness, I never knew. She never, ever let me know. That dream realized the success of Fleetwood Mac created new problems for Stevie. I'm not 18, you know. I, I am not as strong as I used to be, physically. It gets harder and harder to you know, be wonderful every night in front of all those kids that you're 15 years older than. You just have to have enough time in between or it's not fair to the people you're playing for. I don't want to have a tired Stevie walking out on stage trying to do Rhiannon when I'm dead tired. That isn't fair. It's not fair to me because I kill my voice. I strain it to death. It's not fair to them because they paid whatever it was they paid and they don't care if I'm sick. You know, they probably would if I said, now, can we just take a minute here to, I'm ill. You know, at the same time, they're going, well, you're ill, and we spent 12 bucks, and I don't have another $12 for another two months to spend on a concert. And the only thing I can say to that is, you're right, and I'm wrong. It doesn't matter how sick I am. If you pay that much money to come and see me, it is my duty to everyone here to be good. And I can't if I'm too tired. It is important to me that all the shows be special. And I have seen a lot of shows because of extreme, extreme exhaustion not be special. And 
for myself. You know, I there's nothing I'd rather do than go to a great rock and roll concert, but there's nothing I'd rather not do than go to a rock and roll concert by a great band that isn't good. Because I never forget that concert, and I never go to see them again. I, I've seen the tides change. I've seen the people turn away. I've seen people get the wrong impression of, of five people that I love, myself included as that entity, because it doesn't work every time. It absolutely doesn't work if you are so confident that it will work that you forget to do the special things that make everything work. Fleetwood Mac's difficulties only contributed to Stevie's frustration. Stevie explains the real reason it became necessary for her to create a solo album. Well, there's only, you know, one album every two or three years. Um, as a writer, it's like uh, if you are a writer of, of stories or two or three every two or three years, it's not too much. That means you've got about 392 days a year left to do nothing. So uh, for me, who writes a lot all the time, year after year after year, two or three songs every two or three years. Uh, I have such an incredible backlog of material that there's no reason for me to ever write another song unless I can do um, records where I can put out 10 of my songs here and there because I have that many. I, have, I, haven't, I could start recording my next solo album tomorrow. I'm ready. Uh, that's how quickly I write. It's very frustrating when, you know, somebody walks past you and says, oh, are you writing another song? Why? We don't need another song. Nobody needs another one of your songs. You've got too many already. And it's, you know, it rains on your parade a lot. And you start asking people things like, is this stupid? Should I just really watch television and not do this? And you know in your heart you shouldn't. But you start to feel a little tiny bit useless like you're really kind of wasting it is what you do. The album Bella Donna marks the beginning of an association between Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty. Stevie explains how she first came in contact with the Heartbreakers. When I first met Tom, Jimmy Iovine said something to me because I said, well, you know, I really love to sing with Tom. And he said, there's never been a woman on a Heartbreaker album. And I went, hmm. And I talked to Tom's wife, Jane, who is a real good friend of mine, and I said, Jane, and Jane said, before I ever said anything, Jane said, hey, we worked this out. This is just all time to Tom. You know, you talk to Jimmy, we'll just... And Jane and I really had it figured out long before Tom had any idea that we were scheming. And we did scheme, and we, was, we really did do a little bit of scheming, because I knew it would be good, and I knew it would be fun, and I knew Tom would enjoy it. And it's not like... I'm not joining their band or anything. They don't have to, you know... I'm not a part of the Heartbreakers. I'm not anything to them except a friend. But every once in a while, we can do something like sing these, sing Insider and stop dragging my heart around and, and give everybody a little extra moment of real, true magic. Because it just, it kills me. And I figure if it knocks me out that much, it has got to have an effect on them. In a passage from the personal journal that she keeps after every concert, Stevie describes her feelings about working with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. It says, Monday night at the Forum. If only for a moment, I shall tell you what it was to be a part of the Heartbreakers tonight, to be so proud that your heart breaks, to hold on to Adria Petty. That's Tom's little girl. She's eight. She never saw Tom before. And I took her up on the stage. She never saw her day, ever. And I'm going, wow, she's eight years old and I held on to her right. I had to hold her from going on stage. I mean, she kept inching towards, and I kept going, Adria, back. It says, uh, to hold on to Adria Petty and to watch her dance and to tell her that it is imperative that she tell her father how good he was. And as she danced on the stage for her first time, I knew that Bruce Springsteen would have been proud of her. She has the moves down. Needles and pins were good. I feel that Tom and I are better than that, but then we are just beginning, and we will just get better. Gordon said it was Don and Phil, 
dear Gordon, with our love for the Everly Brothers, it could have been faster, and we will certainly get stronger. But it was nothing. But if it was nothing else, it was Tom and I, and Tom and I have the potential to be a stroke of genius inside us, within us. We certainly can sing. Together, we can sing anything. We can sing whatever it is that is important to us. Les Paul and Mary Ford. Singing with Tom and being a guest of the Heartbreakers has only made me see clearly that I want my own band. I do not want a band of musicians who play for the money. I want a band of angels who play for the love. I'm not selfish. I do not want the glory of being a queen. I want a band with Laurie and Sherry and Waddy and Russell and Bob and Ben Mott and Roy, and Bobby and Davey and anyone else that wants to be in it. And really just whoever wants to be a part of this, I'm willing to share it. And I ask very little of anyone. I ask only that you be the best band that you can be. It was only love. And as she sits at her typewriter like Lillian Hellman, and she cries, Julia, my friend, my guide, and my counselor, and as Julia becomes part of the ocean, and her friendship's only part of a memory, and she fights and hangs on to a thread of life that has become daily more important to her, because it is to her, her lifeline, and as Adria Petty looks up at me with love and trust and expectations of me, I make my choice, I make my decision. When the singer is gone, let the song live on. The song The Highwayman describes Stevie's earlier association with another group of male rockers, the Eagles. Um, the, my first knowledge of anybody else except outside of Fleetwood Mac was the Eagles, of whom you have to realize I've been singing along with forever on, on the radio. And, you know, I mean, I, who am I to meet the Eagles, you know? The Highwayman is the high women of old, right? The rogue, the one that's always on the road, that sometimes gives to the rich and sometimes keeps it. Um, in the high women it says she considers slowing down, but then he would never win. Enter competition. She chases beneath the sky, a pale and violent rider. It's like, you kind of have to let them be, be their dramatic selves. And, uh, go with it and not try to not try to be anything else except an intelligent woman with them and that accidentally happens to be a songwriter because if you ever want to sit down and work with them that's the only way you can be stevie nicks has reaffirmed her position as one of the only important females in the male dominated world of rock and roll she describes the affinity she feels with other women musicians heart can't go on stage without Anne or Nancy. Fleetwood Mac cannot go on stage without me or Chris. Uh, we have fought very hard to be anything but a background singer. I think Nancy or Anne or Christine or myself would rather quit and go do something else than be a background singer. And they're really the only, they're, rock and, they're true rock and roll singers in the true sense of the word. And I think that, that Anne and Nancy and Christine and me are the only ones. I mean, not that I don't give credit to Pat Benatar, I do. She's wonderful. But she's new. She's so new that, you know, I go back to Janis Joplin and I go, I, I go too far back to, you know. And Anne and Nancy have been around for a long time. And in the, in the beginning, it was like, after Chris and I were in Fleetwood back, then it started coming out, you know, at, in, the, in the tradition of Christine and Stevie, went Anne and Nancy. And like, see, I liked that. And I, li I liked that a lot. I felt like there, that immediately made a kindred spirit. And, but there isn't anybody else in the rock and roll business that's a woman that I consider with any kind of respect at all because you see, people like the Eagles made me incredibly critical, too, when it comes to, there's nothing I'd rather see than a great woman singer coming along, uh, uh, one that I can listen to, because I like to listen to other people. And there's not too many that come along. She explains how they influence Belladonna. Outside the Rain was the only link between Fleetwood Mac and me. It was the true, it was the song that Fleetwood Mac would have done if they had been involved in this record. It, it was the sort of the dreams or the Sarah that, it was that, it was those chords, that thing. And uh, I thought that it was really important that there be that link in the chain there. Since the rest of it was very much me and very much not Fleetwood Mac, I wanted there to be the link because 
it's, you know, it's dear to me and it's important to me that Fleetwood Mac is still a part of my life and that they understand what I'm doing and that was sort of, that was the Fleetwood Mac song. <laughs> 